Uh, first, Professor, uh, we would like to thank you for accepting our invitation today. It's a great honor for us to welcome you here at our seminars, sharing all your knowledge about plant microbe interactions. Thank you. Uh, so Professor Bart studied plant pathology at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And then he did a PhD at the KU Leuven University in Belgium on immune signaling pathways in Arabidopsis. After that, he started his career at Wageningen University, first as a postdoc, then as assistant and associate professor, and finally as a full professor at the department. There he started to develop his work on vascular wilt pathogen Verticillium dali. Uh, in 2020, he... Uh, in 2020, he was awarded a Humboldt professorship, a program focused on attracting high-profile researchers to Germany uh, by the Humboldt Foundation. Based on that grant, he is now Alexander von Helbold, Professor on Evolutionary Microbiology at the University of Cologne in Germany, and member of the Center of Excellence of Plant Science, C+. Currently, Professor Bart will continue his work on verticillium, and he will expand into the area of soil ecology. So, Professor, thank you again, and welcome. Well, thank you, Gustavo, for the, for the nice words and the nice introduction. Um, I guess I will start by sharing my screen and then I will put this on presentation. And if I then have the pointer, then I think we're ready to go. So um, yes, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to, uh, right, sorry, I need to, um, I need to move you all out of my view. Yes, it's very nice to, to have this opportunity and, and to talk to you. Um, I don't know whether I can really share all the knowledge I have, but um, I will try to tell you a story, um, uh, at least of uh, the most recent developments in my lab and where we are going to. And I hope that it can sketch you some kind of, uh, of view of how I um, think about phytopathology nowadays. And in order to do this, I need to um, take you at least to, to the basics of how I see host pathogen interactions uh, or maybe even host microbe interactions. And uh, to do that, I have this very simple scheme here uh, where I show you this axis, which uh, illustrates the amplitude or the um, uh, amount, you could say, of defense in a host. And so this illustrates that hosts have an immune system or a defense system, no matter how you want to call it. And this can be, the status can be low or off. Um, and it can be activated. The states can be high or on or something like this. And then it's quite relevant that there is a particular threshold at which immunity is reached. And this basically means that the host doesn't suffer from the microbial ingress, the microbial attack. So um, everything starts with molecules that we tend to call microbe associated molecular patterns sometimes also termed pathogen associated molecular patterns, but I don't think that's such an elegant term um, because many of the molecules that it concerns actually uh, are not so much pathogen specific, but much more microbe specific. So for instance, fungi have chitin. Chitin is a microbe associated molecular pattern because it's perceived by, for instance, plant hosts as non-self molecules. So, these hosts have receptors for these molecules on their plasma membrane. And once, once they perceive these molecules, they activate their defense system or their immune system. And we get a status that we call man-triggered immunity. And now the dogma is that this basically explains why hosts, why plants, for instance, are immune uh, to all the microbes that surround them. Same is true for us. We generally don't get disease. There's exceptions, of course, but generally we don't get disease despite the wealth of microbes surrounding us. 
And so we think that this MAM triggered immunity plays an important role in this process. But at the same time, we also know that disease does occur in particular cases. And when does disease occur? Well, we think that has to do with microbes that have the ability to secrete effectors that are able to suppress this MAM triggered immune response. And so when this works, these effectors establish a state of effector triggered susceptibility. And that means that the host gets diseased like here in this picture of Arabidopsis plants that are um, uh, infected by the bacterium Pseudomonas. So effectors are crucial molecules for us phytopathologists if we want to understand how disease occurs. And so I define effectors as molecules that are secreted by microbes during host ingress to mediate colonization. And many of these molecules suppress host immune responses, but they can do other things as well. And I hope by the end of this presentation, you will appreciate that um, uh, these effectors can have other functions to still support host colonization, but not necessarily through the direct targeting of uh, host immune responses. So that's why I say many of them modulate host immunity. Now, there's two points I still would like to make here. One is that uh, here is a schematic picture of a, a, a filamentous microbe that infects a plant host. And the uh, point I want to make is that these effectors are secreted in the in interface between the microbe and the host. And then some of these effectors are taken up by the host cells, end up in the cytoplasm or in other cellular uh, compartments. And these are what we call cytoplasmic effectors. But then some effectors actually do not go there. They stay in this interface. And so these are labeled as apoplastic effectors. And so then I think the other point I would like to make is that it's important to realize that these effectors have uh, been evolved by vi various types of microbes and even other types of uh, organisms that attack plant hosts. So they occur in bacteria, in oomycetes and in fungi, so filamentous microbes, but then even in animals such as uh, uh, nematodes here, uh, the, the, the small worms that, that uh, attack the roots of plants, and also some insects make effectors such as aphids, for instance. So these effectors are widely used by microbes that uh, um, set up symbiosis in the broad sense, I would say, with plant hosts. Very well known and very well studied in, in uh, pathogens and parasites, but even mutualists use effector proteins and other types of effector molecules to support host colonization. So a central role for effectors, but that's not the end of the story. Um, so effectors may become recognized and like that plants have means to reinstall immunity in which case we then call this immunity effector triggered immunity and this is a cascade that goes on and on and on because then there will be pressure on the microbe to evade recognition again by losing effector proteins or modifying effector proteins such that they are no longer recognized or by evolving new effector proteins that again suppress this immune response to lead to effector triggered susceptibility, which may again um, uh, um, lead to the evolution that the development of novel receptors that again recognize these altered effectors or the new effectors in order to reinstall immunity. And so this is an, an, an everlasting arms race that has been uh, described by Dangle and Jones as the zigzag model. And so um, we are particularly interested in, in, in this co-evolution arms race from the pathogen point of view. And I think this uh, illustration here 
uh, from uh, the book of Lewis Carroll, Through the Looking Glass, where we see Alice and the Red Queen, is a very nice way to think about this arms race. So you see this, uh, this Red Queen running very hard, but she's actually not moving forward. And she says, now here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And this sort of, um, uh, for me at least, is a way of thinking about what pathogens need to do in order to sustain this symbiosis with our plant hosts. They need to evolve effectors in order to suppress host immune responses. But then some of these effectors become recognized and that they quickly need to delete or to, to get rid of these effectors in order to um, uh, keep this symbiosis going. And they need to evolve new effectors in order to suppress immune responses and support host colonization in other kinds of ways. And so this requires a, a very uh, uh, constant dynamics of the pathogen in order to be able to go through this process and, and keep this symbiosis going. And we are particularly interested in what the molecular mechanisms are that drive this genomic diversity and the adaptation of pathogens to plant hosts and plant immune systems. And so I'm not going to say too much about this today, um, um, but I think I would like to make the point that we have learned so far that many of these microbes that uh, uh, make such a symbiosis with the plant host evolved what we called a compartmentalized genome. Basically, in these genomes, very often we can assign two bins, two parts. There is a, a large chunk that we typically assign to the core genome. This is where typically household pro processes are encoded, and this is where uh, typically conservational forces operate. These processes have worked fine for these organisms for billions of years, so there's no reason to change this, no reason to touch this. But then these pathogens also need a dynamic part, a dynamic compartment in their genome where they can allow swift adaptation, where they can quickly evolve new effectors, where they can um, uh, omit effector genes uh, once they become recognized or once the effectors that they encode become recognized. And also other pathogenicity pro related processes are encoded here. So, in contrast to the core genome here, the central theme is plasticity, rad rapid adaptation. And so um, uh, this is in, in various shapes and forms, but this, is, uh, this compartmentalization is something we, we very often see in microbes that um, uh, establish symbiosis with plant hosts. So what you see now is a video of two tomato seedlings and you see it's a time-lapse movie and by now you slowly start to see that the two tomato seedlings evolve differently. So the one on the left hand side has not been inoculated but the one on the right hand side has been inoculated with verticillium dali. And verticillium dali is a soil-borne pathogen that will infect plant through the roots and then finds its way into the xylem vessels. And that's then where the fungus starts to sporulate and that's how the fungus then starts to spread throughout the plant, also to the above ground tissues. And you can clearly see that this impacts the development of the plant. So this is a consequence of two things. On the one hand, the fungus blocks the xylem vessels because it physically grows there and spreads there. But at the same time, in a defense response, the plant tries to close down these xylem vessels in order to contain the fungus. And as a combination, uh, as, as a result of this combination, the development of the plant is significantly affected. Now, Towards the end of the life cycle of the plant, the fungus starts to come out of the xylem vessels and starts to colonize the mesophyll and starts to make resting structures that we call uh, microsclerotia. These are heavily melanized. And when the leaves then fall to the floor and decompose, these microsclerotia are released and they can survive in the soil for 10, 15 years without a problem. And so that's then how the fungus survives or waits, sits and waits until there is a new uh, uh, plant root coming by that triggers the germination of 
such microsclerotium and then the cycle starts again. And from this video, it's evident that tomato is a host of Ferticidium. So in this case, I talk about Ferticidium dali, but it's not the only host. And here is just a couple of pictures to show you there's many more hosts. So also olive and uh, cotton and tobacco are hosts of Ferticidium. Well, and even many more plants because in, in, in literally hundreds of dicot plants are hosts to this pathogen. Even individual strains of Ferticidium dali have a very broad host range. So it's completely, I mean, although the, 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 uh, the disease is very similar to vascular wilt caused by Fusarium oxysporum, um, uh, the pathogenicity is completely different because typically Fusarium oxysporum strains, individual strains have a very narrow host range and collectively all the forma specialis together in fact, a wide range of host plants. For verticillium, an individual strain already infects a wide range of host plants. And so this is one of the reasons why we're interested in studying this pathogen. I mean, how does this, this one pathogen uh, uh, evolve and how is it able to keep up with the immune systems of so many different plant hosts at the same time? So how does this broad host range pathogen evolve? And I'm not going to tell a lot about the genome and about the two-speed genome of Ferticidium. I just want to make one highlight. And the one highlight I would like to make is, so what you see here uh, in, the, in, this, in these uh, lanes are karyotypes from the fungus. So basically you see separated chromosomes. And I can tell you that an individual Ferticidium dalia strain always has eight chromosomes. Now, if you very quickly eyeball these different lanes, then you will immediately see that these patterns differ. They are not the same in every lane. And this is a bit counterintuitive because normally you would expect that within the species, every individual has the same karyotype, has the same organization of chromosomes. But it doesn't look like this is the case uh, for these strains unless these strains would not belong to the same species. And so I'm going to uh, zoom into two of these strains, FDLS17 and JR2. And these two strains actually share 99.97% sequence and identity for all the regions that we can align. So I mean, there's no doubt this is one species, and you could even argue this is clonal. So what you see here on the right hand side are the eight chromosomes of the VDLI-17 strain in gray. And then here in white, the eight chromosomes of the JR2 strain. And now on the right hand side, a single chromosome is a single color. And on the left hand side, you can immediately see that chromosomes are composed of segments of chromosomes of the other strain. In other words, we don't see the same chromosomal organization in the two strains. And if you look a bit more carefully, then you immediately also see that in this VDLS17 strain, for instance, the three largest chromosomes are all three about six megabases. And then the, the, the fourth one is a little bit lower than five. Well, for JR2, the largest one is nine megabase which is missing in VDR17. The six megabase chromosomes are missing in JR2. Again, we immediately go to below four. And this perfectly reflects what we see in the karyotypes too. So this tells us that within Ferticillium dali, there's a lot of chromosomal recombinations. In addition to this, these red bars that you can see on these chromosomes indicate sequence regions that are unique, that do not occur in the other strain. And both of these strains have such regions. Also in the JR2 strain, you see that there are these segments. And so these regions are what we call lineage specific. And these are what you could call the adaptive or the plastic part of this Ferticillium dali genome. Clearly, this is where the fungus uh, um, um, yeah, shows plasticity. And to illustrate that this is relevant and that this is important, um, 
So if you realize that the core genome has about 11,000 genes, something like this, depending on the strain you take, um, and this lineage specific part or this adaptive part has a little bit less than a thousand genes. Um, um, so that's over a 10 to one fold uh, uh, ratio. If we look at what the fungus expresses in planta, if we simply look at the most highly expressed genes, then we see that there is a drastic overrepresentation of this variable, this plastic part of the genome. So despite the fact that these were only these relatively small rep sequence blocks on the chromosomes, we see that during host infection, these are overrepresented um, um, with respect to expression. And if we then sort out effector genes in those regions and we make knockouts of these effector genes, then we see that we easily compromise virulence. So that is then what it typically would look like. So the JR2 here is the wild type. It's the wild type proticillium. It causes disease. We see the stunting of the plant for both of the genes. But then for both of these effector genes, if we make a knockout, and we test, we inoculate it on the tomato plants. Then we see that these plants are taller than the plants that are inoculated with the wild type fungus. So it illustrates that the fungus is less able to suppress growth of the plant, it causes fewer symptoms, so it's basically compromised in its virulence. And so this tells us that this dynamic part of the genome, this plastic part of the genome, where we see a lot of presence absence variation is extremely important for virulence during host infection. So I'd say this is a little bit the background that I would like to sketch to, to bring you up to speed with what we think is important uh, that and, and what we think is, is relevant in these genomes of these pathogens. Effectors are important, this we knew, but the, the ability to adapt is, is crucial. And we know a little bit now of how verticillium does this because it uses particular segments of the genome to, to generate plasticity and to mediate adaptation. And so I would like to, to, to carefully shift some gears here and just introduce the realization that we know nowadays that microbiomes are extremely important. We know this for ourselves. We know that we have a lot of microbes on our skin and in our gut, and, and many of these are actually beneficial. And there's a lot of research trying to understand this microbiome and trying to understand microbiome functions. This is uh, true for humans, this is true for animals, but this is also true for plants. And I think one of the perhaps most intriguing phenomenon uh, and also most eye-catching phenomenon has been the take-all uh, decline of, of wheat, where people have, have realized that if you now keep on cultivating wheat on such a field where this disease occurs, then gradually actually after years and years of monoculture, the disease becomes less and less and less. And um, the explanation for this is that over time, actually beneficial Pseudomonas bacteria have been recruited uh, to the soil to basically combat the pathogen and help um, uh, the plants to withstand disease. And so a number of years ago, when we were thinking about this, we started to think, you know, but if this is a, is a strategy of a host, of a plant host to suppress disease, well, wouldn't it be somewhat likely that pathogens have learned and have evolved to interfere in this process? So wouldn't it be likely that pathogens try to disturb this beneficial microbiome of the host in order to promote disease development. So this is sort of um, uh, what triggered our thinking. And then at the time we, we wrote an opinion paper basically proposing that if this is true and if pathogens do such things, then actually it would not be so unlikely that they would perhaps use their effector catalog um, in order to do this. And so we propose that pathogen effector catalogs may actually contain molecules that are there to manipulate the microbiome of the host to the advantage of the pathogen. 
And so we started actively investigating this. And of course, this did not come completely out of the blue for us. So for this, I still need to introduce a little bit of verticillium uh, specifically on tomato. So in tomato, there is two races of verticillium. There is strains that are contained by plants that contain a particular um, um, resistance gene, namely the V1 resistance gene. So plants that contain the V1 resistance gene are able to recognize race one strains that contain the molecule or the avirulence gene AV1. But then there are resistant breaking strains that are able to cause disease on these plants and these belong to race two and so they do not contain this AV1 gene or have a mutated version of this gene. Now both race one and race two are able to cause disease on susceptible tomato germplasm that lacks this V1 immune receptor gene. And so uh, um, about a decade ago, we started to try and identify this AV1 um, uh, race specific uh, uh, avirulence gene. And we, we did that in the end by comparative genomics. And um, it's maybe a bit a complicated diagram, but what I show here is a particular region in the genome where you can see that there is sequence coverage in all the race one strains that we sequenced. But then actually, when we look at race two strains here in red, we don't see coverage of this whole region by all these strains. So we see a lot of plasticity here already in this border, but obviously there is sequence coverage in some of the strains, but then there is a 50 kilobase region where there is no coverage at all in any of the race two strains that we sequenced. So then we thought, okay, this is an interesting region. Let's, let's go for this, let's analyze this. And then when we overlaid this with results from RNA-seq data, where we basically looked at, do we find gene expression in the fungus when it colonizes a plant host? We saw, okay, actually there's only one locus, there is only one peak. Um, uh, which, which uh, spans one potential gene um, uh, that is expressed in this region. So that was our candidate gene that we then called AV1 for AVER, mediating avirulence on V1 plants. Now, I'm go not going to show you all the, the molecular biology and the genetics to sort of provide the evidence that this is indeed the avirulence uh, a gene that matches the V1 um, uh, resistance gene because that's not the purpose of, of uh, this presentation. The only point I'm still going to make here is that so people that, that typically work with effector genes and effector proteins, they will know that many of these effector proteins are lineage specific inventions. So basically they're highly specific for the pathogen you work on. And there is exceptions, but generally you don't easily find homologs in other species. And so we were very much surprised that when we, when we identified this candidate and when we blasted this to public databases, we literally got hundreds of hits to homologs. And then uh, this tree here on the right only shows a, a small selection of them, there are many more. But the point is, if you look very carefully, you will immediately see all of these are plant homologs. So all of these homologs occur in plants, not in microbes. There is only few microbes here, Fusarium oxysporum, one in Colatotrichum, one in Cercospora. Here we have Verticillium and then Xanthomonas. But also these species seem a bit random and they are intermingled into plant homologs in that tree. And so basically we, we, we take this as evidence for the uh, hypothesis that this avirulence gene in verticillium was acquired by horizontal gene transfer from plants, likely as the other microbial homologs. So it looks like we have an avirulence gene product that somehow was hijacked from plant hosts. And we have spent, since we cloned that gene, we have spent efforts trying to find out what does it do? How does it promote verticillium wilt disease in plant hosts? And for a long time, that has been quite unsuccessful. 
But then there were two characteristics that basically got us thinking. Two, I would say, very atypical characteristics of this effector uh, gene. So one is, typically when we talk about effectors, we think about uh, molecules that are encoded by genes of which the expression is tightly regulated, typically only implanta induced. And so for AV1, this is not the case. Actually, yes, it's implanta induced. We still see this, but we actually cannot find conditions where the gene is not expressed. So we also find in vitro expression, which if you think about the biology of ferticillium may not be so relevant, but we also find expression in soil. And so this obviously is somehow relevant to the biology of Ferticillium because it's a soil-borne pathogen. But why would you express your effector genes to uh, colonize plant hosts in the soil when you're not colonizing a plant host to start with? And then there was a second observation and the second observation was we tried for a long time to produce this protein in order to do biochemical assays. And then that really did not work very well for a long time. And whatever we did, we always found the protein back in inclusion bodies in E. coli. And so then we started to realize that maybe this is because e. e. coli doesn't like to produce the protein. And so when we started to think about this expression, for instance, in a soil-based environment, when we thought about bacteria not being really happy to produce this protein, we started to come up with this hypothesis that maybe the AV1 was an antimicrobial protein. And so what we then did is we isolated the protein from these inclusion bodies, denatured them, refolded the protein, and then we checked whether the protein was still intact and functional. And the way to do that was basically to make use of the finding that this was an avirulence protein. So what we did is we injected the protein into plants that express the V1 resistance gene. And so if the protein is recognized, we expect to see a hypersensitive response, a defense response, which we indeed saw. So that sort of confirmed, okay, the refolded protein is functional, it's recognized by the tomato immune system. So maybe now it's also functional when it comes to virulence contribution to the pathogen. And so then we started testing the hypothesis that AV1 is an antimicrobial protein. And to do this, we first of all collected plant-associated bacteria and tested their sensitivity to this protein in vitro. And so here you see a, a diversity of, of species and of strains. Um, uh, the red line here is treatment with millicule water. Um, and then you see two green bluish lines. Um, the, the green one, the, the, the greenest one, I would almost say, is the AV1 protein from Verticillium dali, so really the subject of our studies. And then the bluish one is a homolog of a, um, a sister species of Verticillium dali, Verticillium nubulum. For this talk, may not really so important, um, but what it showed is that although some bacteria clearly are not sensitive to these proteins, like Agrobacterium here, or Ralstonia, or Pseudomonas. Other bacteria seem to be sensitive. So when we here look at Arthrobacter, uh, the water curve looks good, but then in the presence of both these AV1 homologs, we don't see any growth at all. When we look at Bacillus subtilis, there is, no gro there is abundant growth in the presence of water, but there is no growth in the presence of the AV1 from Verticillium dali. In this case, we do see growth in the presence of this nubulum homolog. So Bacillus subtilis is not the only one that is, that is very sensitive to AV1 treatment, at least the AV1 from Verticillium dali. Also here, for instance, Staphylococcus and Streptomyces are very sensitive to AV1 treatment. So this was already a first hint that indeed AV1 could be an antimicrobial protein. And then, so then we did some 
EM microscopy on bacillus treated with this AV1 protein. And what it basically showed is that over time, cells start to, uh, uh, start to swell and start to show all kinds of blabbing. And in the end, they completely collapse. And we don't see this when we treat with water. And in case of this bacillus, we also don't see it when we treat with the uh, nubulum homologue. So these data sort of really convinced us, yes, this is really an antimicrobial protein. It even seems to be a, a bactericidal protein. So if this is the case, then it could be that AV1 is used by verticillium to selectively modulate the microbiome of the host because uh, it is evident that this activity is not ubiqu ubiquitous and not any bacterium is targeted, but particular bacteria seem to be targeted. But of course, in the assay I showed you, we, we sort of randomly selected bacteria that are plant associated. Um, um, this was not done in a plant context. So then we decided to do microbiome profiling. And we did that based on 16S profiling. And to this end, we inoculated for uh, uh, tomato plants as well as cotton plants with the wild type verticillium dali as well as with a deletion strain from which the AV1 effector gene was removed. And these were then compared side by side. And so here you see some of the data of these microbiomes. So we have the mock treatment, we have the wild type verticillium, and we have the AV1 deletion strain on tomato as well as on cotton. And if you now quickly eyeball this, then, well, there is not really obvious differences between the treatments for the different phyla that we found. So then we said, okay, you know, let's, let's put all these data together and let's perform a principal component analysis and see whether we can separate the treatments first of all. And that turned out to be uh, possible, both on tomato as well as on cotton, we are able to separate the treatments based uh, uh, on a PCA. So clearly here in, in tomato, we can separate them on the first axis already with the wild type here on the left, the AV1 deletion strain in the middle and the mock treatment clustering completely on the right. We don't see the same separation in cotton, but also here we can clearly see that the AV1 deletion clusters differently from the mock treatment clusters differently from the wild type. Now, one of the um, uh, assumptions could be, well, you know, but AV1 uh, may be an important virulence factor on tomatoes, so maybe already the, the um, amount of biomass of the fungus makes that there is a change in the microbiome of the host. And we try to take this into account because you will see that the sizes of these dots are different. And so the size of the dot now is a measure for the amount of biomass. And so here, yes, on tomato, the AV1 deletion strain doesn't make so much biomass. Um, but if we look in cotton, in cotton, it's different. On cotton, it looks like the virulence contribution or the contribution to host colonization is not so big. And so still we see a separation of the wild type treatment versus the AV1 deletion strain treatment. So this sort of gave us the confidence that there is, there is something in these data and we should be able to find something in this microbiome that is different and that separates the treatment. And so then we started digging deeper and, and, and going to orders and families of the bacteria. And so um, um, the treatments were different for the different plant species, but um, the, I think, interesting observation that we made is that although the microbiomes of these hosts are different, and although the impact of verticillium on these microbiomes are different, there is also a commonality. And the commonality is that Sphingomonodalis, Sphingomonad bacteria seem to be repressed in the presence of AV1. And so that gave us a first hint that maybe Sphingomonad bacteria are targeted by AV1 during host colonization by verticillium on these different plant 
species. And so, okay, while digging deeper, we basically came up with the same genera that seem to be repressed in both of these species. So here in a tomato, you will see a repression of Sphingobium, Novosphingobium, Sphingomonas, um, same species that we also see back here, Sphingobium, Sphingomonas, Novosphingobium. So both in cotton as well as in tomato. So that's when we thought, okay, you know, let these bacteria be our first target to try and find out whether these are specifically targeted by verticillium during host colonization. And if so, why would the fungus do this? So the first step in order to try and confirm this was to test in vitro whether AB1 then has um, uh, uh, effects against these bacteria. And so here you see representatives of these finger monads um, uh, now with two curves, the water curve in red and with the AB1 treatment here in, in blue. And clearly in all these cases, you see that AV1 suppresses the growth of these bacteria. The dynamics is different. The sensitivity is different between the species, but all in all, it looks like all of them are sensitive to treatment with this bacteria, uh, sorry, with this protein in vitro. So then, okay, it seems that verticillium uh, can exploit this uh, effector protein in, in order to suppress these bacteria, but what could be the relevance of this? And, and, and uh, one of the assays we did is shown here is basically, again, in vitro, but now we did a competition assay. We did a co-cultivation assay. And then we measured the amount of verticillium biomass in this competition assay. And so what we then saw is when we delete AV1 from the genome of verticillium, we see that in this in vitro assay, the fungus makes less biomass in the presence of some of these finger monads, so Novus fingobium here and sphingopixis. If we then reintroduce the gene and we make a complementation, we also complement the uh, compatibility of the fungus and it is able again to compete with these bacteria and it is able to again make a wild type level of fungal biomass. So I guess this tells us that this, these sphingomonads are antagonists of verticillium growth and that verticillium uses AV1 to basically target these antagonists. So this is all nice, but of course this is in vitro. And so then we try to set up experiments in planta in order to demonstrate a relevance for the expression of this AV1 effector protein. And so what we did is we coated seeds from tomato with, in this case, a representative of this fingomonas, in this case, fingopixis. Also, and then we, we we planted these seeds and in, in some cases we infected, in other cases we had a mock treatment. Basically, this is the, the whole panel of, of what we um, uh, tested. And then I think you can immediately see that um, these sphingopixis bacteria make a positive contribution to the health of the plant. So the effect of the verticillium infection is less than in the absence of these sphingopixis. But here I should say this was not done in a sterile setting. So there is also, Sphingopix is most likely in this setup already present. The only difference is in the case of the plants here on the right hand side, the, the seeds were coated, you could say, with an extra load of this Sphingopix. And then we started going in and we started looking at amounts of these bacteria for the wild type, the, the, the plants treated with the wild type fungus and the plants treated with the uh, fungus that did not carry AV1. And so these are just three different ways of, of making exactly the same point of looking at the biomass of the bacterium, either by colony counts or by, by um, uh, PCRs and, and, and relative biomass uh, when compared to verticillium. But the, the message is basically uh, the same in all cases. Whenever AV1 is present, the amount of sphingopixis bacteria is lower. So with that, I think we, we, we really show that AV1 is used by verticillium to suppress these sphingopixis antagonists of verticillium growth. And like that, 
<clears throat> Fertilicinium uses AV1 to contribute to host colonization. So I showed this life cycle before, and I, when I now draw in this effector protein, then we think it is relevant already in the soil context because AV1 is expressed constitutively, it's expressed at, at, at all the stages of uh, the life cycle of Ferticidium. Uh, clearly, it's also expressed during host colonization, and that's where we show that it contributes to um, uh, suppression of these uh, sphingopixis bacteria in the microbiome. So when we realize that this indeed is true, that, it, that verticillium uses an effector protein to manipulate the host microbiome, we started to think about, you know, can we take this further? Are there, are there more effectors like this? And in order to do this, we um, uh, thought, you know, we can do all kinds of things, but maybe a straightforward way is, let's now screen the whole effector complement of verticillium for those proteins that are predicted to have a fold that resembles an antimicrobial protein. And maybe these could be good candidates to test. And so like this, we identified 10 potential candidates that may have a fold that resembles an antimicrobial protein. And so then we said, okay, let's have a look at expression. So here we see all kinds of conditions. I mean, this is all implanta on top. Um, but then all kinds of other treatments. Uh, so implanta means in arbidopsis, in, in tobacco, in cotton, um, but also in vitro, in PDB, and in MS, and in sapex dogs. And we also use some treatments with bacteria or bacterial components. Um, when you eyeball this, you will not immediately say, well, there is very clear expression. There is very clear conditions that you should test. So, um, I'm going to uh, spend one slide on this candidate that we call AMP2. Now, from the way how we identified AV1, you will realize this was a lineage specific effector because it's present in the dynamic compartment that was present in some strains and absent in other strains. Think back about this, this genome that has to adapt continuously. I think this is a prototype effector that resides in such a region. Now the AMP2 effector that I'm going to talk about briefly is a core effector. That is, we find it in the core genome and so far in all the strains that we've tested contain this effector. Um, there is not really evidence to believe that it's highly expressed in planta nor in any of these conditions that um, we screened here. But then we realized when we treated Ferticillium with soil extract that all of a sudden this gene is, is highly induced. We don't see expression in plants, but we see expression in soil. And so we uh, uh, produce the protein in this case, um, also here uh, production in E. coli didn't work, but what we did here is we engineered Ferticillium such that it constitutively produces this protein. And then we used culture filtrates to test. And so the culture filtrate of this uh, transformant basically uh, uh, shows antagonistic activity towards bacillus and towards pseudomonas. So pseudomonas was not targeted by AV1. So here we already see that there is a difference in the activity spectrum. And so these graphs basically um, uh, represent experiments to try and demonstrate the role of this effector in the soil. And so what we did is we quantified verticillium, the wild type verticillium here in blue, and the deletion strain of AMP2 um, when growing in soil. And so clearly here in, in, in untreated soil, which is just potting soil that we take from our greenhouse, you can see that the wild type verticillium colonizes better than this deletion strain. Now, if we treat the soil such that we sterilize it, that we remove the microbiome from the soil, then all of a sudden we don't see a difference in colonization anymore. Both strains, the wild type as well as the deletion strain, are equally able to colonize. 
And if we then reintroduce some of the untreated soil in the sterilized soil, allow a microbiome to settle, then all of a sudden we see the uh, difference in the colonization coming back again. So this sort of tells us that this effector protein makes a contribution towards survival in the soil related to the presence of a microbiome. In sterilized soil, not necessary, but in uh, uh, soil with microbes, this effector apparently is important for survival. So in this stage where verticillium is in the soil, we now have two effector proteins that seem to play a role. And so these two effector proteins make a, a different contribution to, uh, um, uh, with respect to activity. So now for a final example, I would like to go to this effector that we call AMP3. Also that one, I mean, there is no clear expression in all these conditions that we tested, but then we found out that this one seems to be expressed at the stage when the fungus makes microsclerotia, survival structures. The fungus is able to do this in vitro. And when it does so, we see that the expression of AMP3 is highly activated. And the green gene here is a marker for microsclerotia production. So the expression of AMP3 coincides with the expression of this marker gene. During host colonization, we don't see anything, even at very late stages, in contrast to AV1, which is highly expressed. But then there's a, at these stages, we also don't see the formation of microsclerotia. But we can sort of do a trick to trigger microsclerotia formation by putting these leaves or these plants in a, in, a, in a plastic bag and seal that for a while. Then we start to see the formation of microsclerotia and then we also start to see expression of this gene. And when we then started to look a bit more in detail, we basically were able to find out that only in the cells that develop into microsclerotia, this effector protein is produced. So here with GFP uh, fusion, you ni can nicely see that it's not expressed in, in hyphae, but it's only expressed in those cells that turn into microsclerotia, which then also explains why we do not find a high expression, not because it's only in very few cells that the gene is expressed. Now this effector protein has antibacterial activity, but that's not the reason why I show it here. The reason why I show it here is that in addition to antibacterial activity, and in contrast to the effectors I've been discussing before, this effector protein now also has antifungal activity. Again, selective, it doesn't concern all fungi, but several fungi are, uh, the growth of several fungi is inhibited in the presence of this effector protein. So this now turns out to be an antifungal effector protein. It's not important for host colonization because we don't see differences in, in host colonization for deletion strain as well as for and re restoration and complementation strains. But if we then do this assay for microsclerotia production by sealing these, these plants in a bag, we do see that the amount of microsclerotia is compromised in the deletion strain and is restored again in complementation strains. So, this effector protein contributes to the survival and to the formation of resting structures that are then um, able to uh, start new generations of the, of the fungus. And this is a, a bit of a busy slide and I will not run through this. It's just to sort of further underpin that is really the antifungal activity that is important here. So in the deletion strain, we see shifts in, in, in uh, in basically in the fungal population uh, during host colonization. We see that some bacteria are um, uh, differentially abundant, but there's more fungi that are differentially abundant. But what's perhaps the most interesting observation? If we look at the differentially abundant bacteria, well, some of them are repressed and some of them are, are, are increased. And in the end, it's a sort of 50-50 ratio, not for the fungi. So the fungi that are differentially abundant are basically almost all repressed and very few 
uh, show an increased abundance. And it's basically also shown in this plot here, where we specifically look at the genera that are then differentially abundant. I mean, all the fungal species, of almost all the fungal species that are listed here are suppressed in the presence of this AMP3 effector gene. And so with that, I think uh, you can sort of think of a model where the fungus secretes this effector protein during these stages when it uh, comes out of the xylem and starts to uh, colonize this mesophyll that is decaying because the plant is senescing. And with that, it sort of can clear a niche to form these resting structures that safeguard the next generation. Okay, so then that effector protein is a, is a third example. And with this, I think I sort of showed you that during different stages of the life cycle, Ferticillium uses different effector proteins to manipulate the microbiomes that it encounters at those stages, which clearly are different at the various stages. So with that, I would like to sum up. I, I think I showed you that Ferticillium is a soil-borne a uh, broad host range pathogen that has a compartmentalized genome. It has lineage specific as well as core effectors that are exploited for microbiome manipulation. And, and in the end, I think, I hope I convince you that there is a differential activity of these effectors and a life stage dependent exploitation. And so my final slide is my acknowledgement slide. A lot of the work that I talked about today has been done by a former PhD student, presently a postdoc in my group by Nick Snelder, uh, with the help of, of, uh, of many others. Um, but I will not uh, uh, go through these names. So these are the people that work with me presently in Cologne. I also still have a number of people that work with me in in Wageningen. And then there is a, a, a number of collaborators that contributed to, to this story. And last but not least, I would like to thank the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for making my move to uh, Cologne possible. And with that, I'm going to stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor, for your excellent talk. So now uh, we have well, 10, 15 minutes for questions. If anybody wants to to make a question, please. Uh, I think Claudia has. Can I, can I talk or should I write? Yeah, no, no, you can talk. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Dr. Bart. It was uh, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I was curious about the virulence aspects of this different isolates of verticillium. Did you see any correlation with the different effectors that these strains have with the different uh, uh, plants that they infect or something like that? So that's, that's, that's a very relevant point you touch. Um, here the complication, I mean, we, the, the short answer is no. And the complication is that we have very poor insight in what really the host ranges of these strains are because they have such broad host ranges and clearly i mean in the lab we test them on a particular plant but that, that that tells little about where they came from and how they evolved in nature now um on the one hand some of these or several of these effectors that i talked about are core effectors so basically they are present in all strains and here you would have to assume that irrespective of the host they, they should make a similar contribution on all of these hosts. Now, perhaps the more interesting one is the AB1, because AB1 is not present in all strains and is race specific. And so an intriguing uh, phenomena has been already for a long time that um, uh, race one strains are generally, are generally more aggressive than race two strains. And so um, uh, then the, your question comes back into mind um, because can we then explain this through this microbiome manipulation? And I think at this stage, we, we actually cannot. But of course, what we cannot exclude is that also in race two strains, there are lineage specific effectors that, that, that have similar functions that we still just do not recognize today. So for this, our knowledge is simply too limited, I think. 
Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think now, Aranha or Claudia, do you have another question? Can I can yeah. I explore a little more? No, <laughs> Sorry. no problem. No problem. Yeah. We have uh, we have done experiment here with sugarcane, and we grew the sugarcane in different types of soil. I work with a fungus uh, that causes a disease in sugarcane that is named smut. Yeah. It's a fungus, right? Yeah. So yeah. what we did was we grew sugarcane in different types of soils. Was one was a rich type of soil. Um, uh, well, I forgot the name in English, argiloso, I forgot the name. Well, it's a rich type of soil. And another one is a sandy soil, you know, poor kind of nutrient soils like this. And then after this sugarcane grew for a year, we got the cones, took to the lab and prepared an experiment where we inoculated the fungus in these cones that came from different types of soils. And we had also different types of varieties of sugarcane. We had a um, susceptible and a resistant variety. And we got different results in terms of the growth of the fungus. It yeah. was amazing. Yeah. I don't have the results yet of the microbiome, but yeah. I believe there's something there, you know? Yeah, of course, this could very, I mean, this could very well be. I, the, the challenge obviously is always to disentangle what is going on, right? Because I mean, also for us now, I start a bit bold by saying that um, we now think as a factor is not necessarily as molecules that target the immune system. But at the same time, you could of course say that also the microbiome is sort of an exogenous part of the immune system. And uh, like that contributes to health. And these effectors that I talk about still target the immune system, um, uh, but just in a broader sense, in this holobiome uh, uh, sense. Um, so what we, I guess, know very little about is uh, microbiome. Well, we start to unravel nowadays a little bit, but then all these um, edaphic factors, all these soil factors, you know, that yeah, we, we, we actually don't know so much about soil physics, soil structure, um, nutrients, nutrient availability, and how that then directly or indirectly um, uh, affects plants, plant immunity, plant microbiomes, and so on. I think it's still a, a, a big, big black box that we just know so little about. Yes, but I was, I was really impressed with the results. You know, they are, these are preliminary results, of course, but yeah. I, I, yeah. I, what I want to do is to do a transcriptome in the plant to see if there's something about the immune system. Yeah. And also, of course, to see the microbes that are yeah. there. Yeah, I, this could be very relevant, of course. Absolutely. Yes. I, I thought it was amazing. There's a whole world that I didn't understand yet, you know, I kind of... Yeah, it's something we, I mean, I mean, obviously, I... I only need to look into the mirror. I mean, I did this too. We very much looked at these, these plant pathogen interactions in a binary fashion. It's just your plant and your pathogen, and this is a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And that's what we studied for decades. And, and you know, that's what I did too. Um, it's only now that you start to realize, or at least that I start to realize that this is maybe a bit naive because this does not happen in, in a vacuum. Of course, there's all kinds of other organisms contributing to this and, and microbes are obvious partners in this. Um, so yeah, that may have a big influence. Absolutely. Great. Very nice. Thank you very much for your talk. Eh? <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, I think now, uh, Arena, you can... Professor Aranha. Okay, yeah. good afternoon, Bart. Hi, my name Hello. is Luis. Um, my name is Luis Camargo. I'm from the Department of Plant Pathology. And I enjoyed your, your talk very much. Your, your data is pretty convincing. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, going back to, to, to AVE, AVE 1, um, you argued that it, it has a, a, probably an origin in the plant kingdom. So to have an idea, what is this, the homolog of these genes, what are they doing in the plants? Well, so that is a that is a bit mysterious still. So um, 
these plant homologues have been uh, annotated as expansin likes, but then the, the, the trick is in the like, that because the like basically says, well, it does not have the enzymatic function or functions of expansins. So they, they sequence-wise, they look a bit like it, but they don't seem to have that function. So that was not very helpful. Then uh, uh, many of these are annotated as plant natriuretic peptides, PNPs. And these PNPs have been described uh, with all kinds of functions, including uh, uh, modulation of photosynthesis, modulation of water household, uh, the ability to open stomates. And so when we first saw this, we thought this is the explanation of how AB1 contributes to virulence because if the fungus in the xylem is able to open stomates, then it will increase uh, transpiration of the, uh, in the plant. And with that, it will increase the sap stream and it will increase its own spread. Um, we don't think this is the case. Um, so we have determined that verticillium AV1 can still open stomates. That's absolutely true. But when we now make an AV1 deletion strain, we have a clear penalty, a clear virulence penalty. And if we then introduce some of these PMPs that have the ability to open stomates, then we don't restore the virulence penalty. So we don't think that that explanation can sort of um, uh, explain the virulence contribution. Now, what we are starting to do, because then the obvious next question would be, well, but you know, if, if, if we, uh, if our hypothesis and our proposal is right, then it could be that actually many of these plant homologs are also antimicrobial proteins. And so um, uh, here I have to say that we only tested one of them briefly. And so that one protein indeed turned out to display antimicrobial activity, but we have not tested this extensively. And so what we're trying to do now is, first of all, in AV1 itself, determine the residues that are important for the antimicrobial activity. And with that, we can better look at the whole plant family and try to predict whether this antimicrobial activity is, is something they commonly share or whether this is only for some of these members. At this moment, we don't know. But obviously, when we tested the antimicrobial activity, we took the one that in the phylogenetic tree is really the closest to AV1. So we really need to do a more thorough analysis to be able to, to say something about this really. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, uh, I think we have one more question here in the chat. It's from Maria Leticia. Thanks for the great presentation, Bart. I'm curious about the role that you think about AV1 has in the sphingomonas and in the bacteria. And are you planning on investigating the molecular role of AV1 in the plant microbial community? Yeah, so, if, I mean, so those that are really into the bacteria, so when we first started screening, I, I told you we took plant associated bacteria and then we saw activity against bacillus and a few others. And for those that, that immediately made connections, they could have seen, hey, you have activity against gram positives and not against gram negatives. And so initially our thinking was, it has something to do with the cell wall. It has to do maybe something to do with peptidoglycan um, because you know, that's obviously where these uh, two groups differ. Um, then we started to do the microbiome profiling and then we, um, in our setup, which may be the limitation of the, our setup, but in our setup, we did not come across gram positives at all. So also not being differentially abundant. This is where then the sphingomonas surfaced. But then sphingomonas, well, you know, that's gram negative. So that does not immediately tie in again with the peptidoglycan. Um, at this moment, we are digging into this. We're doing mutant analyses in bacillus. We are uh, trying to uh, find targets for the AV1 protein. So yes, we are definitely uh, interested in this. And, and clearly in bacillus, which is some kind of you know, model bacterium that's easier to do than in the sphingomonad species, which are more difficult to handle. Um, 
At this moment, it's, it's difficult for us to say whether we are looking at um, you know, a target that is present in the sensitive bacteria and that is not present in the insensitive bacteria, or whether the insensitive bacteria have other means of you know, being resistant, so to say, against this AV1 protein, um, because they, you know, besides lacking a target, they could, you know, whatever, detoxify, uh, uh, inhibit uh, the AV1 protein for whatever role it has. So um, at this moment, we don't know so much, but clearly this is something we're very, very much interested in because in the end, you know, this could also uh, uh, be a new way to find novel antibiotics, right? I mean, we, we do find antimicrobial molecules. So um, identifying the mechanism by which they are antimicrobial is very valuable also for us. Okay, uh, I think we have well, one more question from Gustavo. It's the same question from Maria, but it's also regarding the AMP2. Yeah, so the AMP2, um, um, I have to admit that protein is a bit dif more difficult for us. So at this moment, we are not doing that um, because we're limited. So to really be able to study a mode of action, it would be convenient if you can have the protein and do biochemical assays. And like that, we can do treatments of loop mutant libraries and we can try to generate spontaneous mutants and all these kinds of things that you would like to do in order to find a target in a bacterium. Um, so for AMP2, until today, we have not found a way to produce it. And so the only way we have uh, produced it so far is because we tricked verticillium to express it constitutively rather than only in soil. And like that, we have uh, uh, culture filtrates. And, and then, of course, we could go through purification of culture filtrates, but the yields are really low. So it's not really a, 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 yeah, a viable way of getting sufficient amounts of proteins to start going through uh, screening procedures. So at this moment, we did not start doing this because we don't have the means to um, uh, get sufficient amounts of proteins in our hand. But clearly, I mean, in, at the end of the day, yes, it would be very interesting to do this type of approach because what I do show, I think, is with, with all the different proteins that we have now identified, there is a different activity spectrum. And so that strongly suggests there is a different mechanism behind it of how they are antimicrobial. And, and at the end of the day, this is what we would like to discover. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Uh, if not, I have a, a quick one. Uh, <laughs> so in the classical zigzag model, we, we study particular actors. So one pathogen, one, uh, one plant host, one effector, but now we're talking about the plant yeah. microbe, uh, microbiome. So now how can we shift and update this classical zigzag model to this kind of knowledge? That's maybe a quick question, but the answer I can, I can talk for an hour about that. Um, I think there's a couple of things that are relevant to say. One is um, maybe it's important to keep in mind that we should use the zigzag model as a way to think about how um, recognition evolves and how evasion of recognition evolves. Um, if we do it like that, I think it still works quite fine. Um, if we use it to try and, and describe, you know, an infection at this moment and what is taking place during that infection, it becomes a bit chaotic and a bit problematic. So that is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, well, but if you now conceptually take this as a model to describe the interaction between two organisms, especially if one of the two is a parasite of the other, then I think you could also see that in the interaction, for instance, between verticillium and sphingomonads, similar, similar sorry, processes would operate. 
because as soon as verticillium has evolved something to negatively impact sphingomonas, then sphingomonas sort of undergo a pressure in order to try and overcome this. And so also that could become a sort of zigzag on its own. Whether that then leads to a cascade like we typically know for plants and resistance genes and they get broken and there is a new resistance gene and so on. This of course we don't know, but it would be intriguing to, to, to have a look at this and, and to try to, to um, uh, demonstrate this maybe. But yeah, if you strictly think from the perspective of, okay, we would like to use this model as a way to describe an infection and to describe the dynamics in this infection spot, I, I do agree it becomes very much complicated if we then need to start thinking about not things as a one-in-one -in -one interaction, but as a multi-organism uh, community, yeah, then it becomes a bit complicated. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I think uh, it's time already. So Professor Bart, thank you again, and for You're your amazing welcome. presentation. Yeah, and for your time. Okay. I hope it was not too long. No, it was really, really good. Thank you again. I enjoyed. It was a pleasure. So I'm gonna finalize here. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice week. Bye. Bye. -bye.